let's go back tonight to uh, Ephesians 6. And uh, we have been flying through this armour and talking about all the various uh, items of the armour. And God willing, what I want to do tonight is to cover two of them. Uh, so you've got buy one, get one free. Uh, so well done to you. You've got two for the price of one tonight. So we're going to look at two of them this evening and we're going to focus on verse 17. Uh, just to bring everybody up to speed, there are six items of the armor. Six items of the armor. And what the Bible says is put on the armor of God. We're to put it on. And that, that idea is of a continuous action. It's not enough to say, well, 50 years ago on a Tuesday night I put on the armor and I've never changed since. Well, put it politely to you. When was the last time you changed your socks? I mean, 50 years ago your socks will start walking for you. Um, you don't want to do that. There's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing thing. You might have started it once. Uh, I was laughing to myself. There was uh, talking to me about wee babies that have been born recently to uh, friends of ours. And uh, they've said they're intensive care and they've put clothes on them now for the first time. And I thought to myself, there's no looking back after that. <laughs> he's, he's having to wear clothes from that day forward. Um, so it's the same way that we put on the armor of God, perhaps for the first time after we become Christians, but it's to be a regular process in our lives. And what I'm trying to bring out over these past number of weeks is one message really to us. You need to put on the armor of God. You really need to make that a priority of your spiritual life. You can't just sort of glibly say, oh, well, you know, me and God have got this sorted. God's in charge. God's sovereign. God's in control. Yeah, but you're responsible too. You know, don't be just putting it on the general all the time. The foot soldiers need to do their level mm -hmm. bit, bit as well. So six items in the armor. What we said before is that the first three, which is the belt, the breastplate, and the sandals were always worn. They were the regular daily uh, items of, of this armor that they would have picked up every morning, put on themselves. But the latter three which refer to the shield, the helmet, and the sword, were only taken up whenever conflict was about to happen, whenever they were about to enter into war. And the reason why, for example, we say that is the two little words, above all, in verse 16. So it's referring to a, an intensifying of the circumstances, a, a worsening, a developing, a deteriorating even of the circumstances where they need to go into open conflict. So put it like this. Every single day of your life, you are to bind truth around yourself. Every single day you are to bind righteousness onto your chest in faith and love. Every single day you are to bind peace to your feet every step of the way. But whenever you find that the enemy is coming against us and it's like an evil day and there's this acceleration of his assault upon our lives and we're, we're, we're entering into new blessings and new territory in God and you find the enemies then really offering pushback, what we need to do is take up faith. We need to take up hope of salvation and we need to take up the rhema word of the Lord and I'll explain all those terms. But the idea, as I said last to us last week, is the order is very important there. A shield is only picked up when there's long-term or long-range warfare, i.e. arrows and javelins and rocks. It's the early beginnings of the battle. That's how they started battles normally. They didn't just charge at each other. They normally sent out skirmishers and back and forth and tried to uh, basically puncture one another. And you needed a shield for that purpose. And faith is, is our confidence in God that protects us from all the fiery darts of the evil one. But as I said last week, there is mid-range attack, which is aimed, let's get the head of the guy, get a bit closer, let's try to knock his brains out. You need to then take on a helmet. And then when it gets really up close and personal, it's sword to sword, it's uh, very much hand-to-hand -hand conflict, and therefore you need the sword. And we're going to look at those two items, if we have time tonight, which is the helmet and the sword. And we'll try to cover these uh, tonight. So, let's look at verse 17. Obviously, we've already alluded to it here, but let's nonetheless read it. It says in verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word or the rhema word of the Lord. Let's look at this first one then, the helmet of salvation. So, if I was to ask us tonight, what's the purpose of the helmet? Um, somebody would rightly say it's to protect your head. 
is to protect your head. And this old noggin of yours and mine, it is a vulnerable part of our bodies. It's amazing that all the calculations and all the various uh, strategies that our bodies are able to perform is lodged in this brain between our, our ears, and yet it's incredibly vulnerable. Uh, we're, we're very vulnerable creatures when you think of it. So the purpose of a helmet was to protect the head. And more specifically, when you think about protecting the head, a helmet has to protect a number of things for a soldier. Think of the following. It has to protect his mind. It has to protect his mind. In other words, if he gets blunt force trauma to the brain and his whole perception of how reality is going, he's going to be no help to the battlefield. I mean, he needs to be having a clear mind. He needs to have clear thinking. As well as that the armor for the helmet in that case, it needs to also protect his eyes. There's no point in having a big, you know, steel balaclava over your head and we, you know, visor covering you. You can't even see out of your uh, two inches in front of you. There's no point with that. So the point is that we need to have clear vision. It has to protect the mind, to offer clear thinking. It has to offer uh, protection to the eyes to provide clear vision. But then thirdly, it also has to protect the ears. Because in conflict, you need to hear the blast of the trumpet. You need to hear the man beside you. You need to hear if there's a, a call to retreat or a call to advance or a call to hold the ground or whatever it is. You need to have your wits about you. You need clear hearing. You need clear hearing. So already from the outset, just from a very, very practical point of view, a helmet was always designed to protect the brain, to protect the eyes, and to protect the hearing of the soldier. That's what a good helmet will always do. Obviously, you can see parallels here uh, with our own experience. The spiritual warfare that you and I often have to involve ourselves in requires clear thinking, clear vision, and clear hearing. And an awful lot of the enemy's interest is an actual fact to make our thinking muddled, to make our vision impaired, and to also impair our hearing, or that we're at least hearing the wrong person. So there's an awful lot of importance, I would say, is connected to this helmet. As you look here in verse 17, it has a specific name. It says, salvation is our helmet. Salvation is our helmet. Now, I want to look at two scriptures because Paul is quoting from the Old Testament when he quotes verse 17 here. Let's go back to Isaiah, Isaiah 59. Uh, Isaiah 59 and verse 17. And this, by the way, is the origins of the armor of God where um, Paul gets this whole uh, message from. But I want you to notice this. It's really unusual. Verse 17 says, For Yahweh, for God, put on righteousness as a breastplate, which is the same idea of the breastplate of righteousness. You know, it's God's armor, but he gives it to us. But crucially, it says, And God himself puts on a helmet of salvation. Well, this is the question you have to ask. Who does God need saved from? You know, we think of salvation means, oh, you're rescued from something. You were in danger. You were in some peril and God rescued you. But why would God put on a helmet of salvation seeing that he's the one who saves? And by implication, he doesn't need to get saved. What you must understand is what uh, this term means. It is a helmet that signifies God's expectation of salvation. It's almost as if, you know, when a, when a man says, the guy rolled up his sleeves. Well, why did he roll up his sleeves? Because there was business to be done. It wasn't that he was, you know, very precious about his wrist or something. It wasn't a, anything, you know, sartorial. It wasn't to do with his dress sense. Whenever you, you change something of your outward appearance, it's often a declaration of what you're going to do. And in the same way, God says, I put on a helmet of salvation because I have an expectation I'm going to bring deliverance into this situation. So if you look on a wee bit further, it, it says he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. He was clad with zeal as a cloak, with a passion that's going to fulfill this purpose. Verse 18 gives us this expectation. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay. Okay? It says fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. That's pure expectation. God says, I will repay, I will repay. That's what he's talking about in this context. And verse 19 says, so shall they 
fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Four times in those two verses, it talks about a certainty, an expectation, a sense of something turning around. So whenever the Bible, for example, talks about a helmet of salvation, it's not talking about necessarily stick on your John 3.16 helmet that you feel nice and saved. That's not what it's referring to. But it's referring to a mindset that God has that there is an expectation of breakthrough. It's an expectation of deliverance happening. It's an expectation that enemies will be punished. It is an expectation that when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. It's not the sense of, well, I hope God will show up and I don't know and it's 50-50 and I don't really know what to do. What do you think? Well, let's gather an assembly together. Let's have a big discussion whether God will show up. No, the helmet of salvation that God has on his head is this. I see what the enemy's up to and it ain't going to fly anymore. That's expectation. And what the Lord is wanting to share with us in this helmet is his expectation of breakthrough. It's his sense of victory. You know, when you talk to most Christians, I mean, you would nearly need to reach for Dazi Pan after talking to them. It would, honest to goodness, it would, it would give you the jaundice. It would absolutely depress you to no end. And the world is getting worse. And this situation is getting worse. And basically, we just need to get in our bunkers, buy a lifetime supply of beans, and just hold out until the rapture happens. Hopefully, it'll happen not too soon because the whole world's going wrong because of red Facebook. Friends, if you're listening like that and you're talking like that, you don't have a helmet of salvation on your head. All you've done is look at a big fat enemy and said, he's there. All of Israel in the days of David looked at Goliath and says, there he is, all nine foot of them. He's all right, he's there. David said, there's prime meat for me to take. There's the prey, there's the victory. It was a difference of mindset. And oftentimes, friends, you see, hope, by the way, Hope is not that your head is in the ground and you're just blindly optimistic. Hope is never blind. Hope is never blind. It looks and says there is a problem. And if you've no hope, you say there is a problem, there is a problem, and the problem's bigger than anything before. But if you have hope, you look at the problem and says there is a solution. That's the difference. It's the half empty, half full rationale. What way are you going to look at it? So it says here about the Lord. He sees the enemy in Isaiah 59. He says he's up to no good. He's spreading his evil throughout the nations. He's raising up evil like a flood. He's spreading darkness. And the Lord says, I will repay with fury. I will repay what he's done. I will raise up a standard and declare the battle lines against him. And we're going to break through here. Okay. That's the Old Testament quotation. Let's go to another New Testament one Paul is quoting from. And actually Paul is quoting Paul. And it's found in 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 here and verses 8 and 9. So keep a wee place in Ephesians 6. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 8 and 9. So it says here, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, which is righteousness, again, uh, quoting from Isaiah 59, um, but it says, and a helmet, the hope of salvation. Notice the key difference. In Ephesians 6, 17, it says, put on the helmet of salvation. But here in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8, it says, put on the hope or the expectation of salvation. Put on the hope of victory. Put on the hope of deliverance. That's what he's referring to. And it goes on to describe it here in, in verse 9. Why should you put on the helmet of hope of salvation? For this reason, verse 9. Because God did not appoint us to wrath, but to appoint, uh, obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or whether we sleep, we should live together with him. What Paul is saying here is this. He says the reason why we have the ultimate hope of salvation is because Jesus has taken away the worst case scenario possible. The wrath of God has been cancelled for us. And seeing that the wrath of God has been cancelled for us. Well how's your future going to be? Pretty good. <laughs> you know you speak to a man or woman who's unsaved. The Bible says wrath's ahead of him. Judgment's ahead of him. All he has to look forward to is his death. It's his last day of happiness on planet earth. 
if he lives this way. Heaven is now for him. If he dies as he is, he's going to stand before God. He's going to have to face all of his sin and then he's sent to hell. But if you've trusted in Christ, that's been all dealt with. So the future is no longer cheerless. The future is no longer hopeless. If God has rescued us from the greatest problem ever, which is the wrath of God. Can I tell you the devil is less than the wrath of God? So if the, the wrath of God, the supreme problem that you and I have to face has been addressed by Jesus because he died and rose again, what about this lesser enemy? What about these lesser problems in life? If we work from the greater to the less, of course we're going to hope all the time. And mind you, we have to remind ourselves about this constantly. But if we have this ingrained in our thinking, it does help us along the journey. You go a wee bit further there. It says not only have we been saved from a negative future, but our future is glorious to obtain salvation. N not just, oh yes, you got born again, now write your name on the front of the Bible there. But the fact is, friends, we have a salvation ahead of us when every trace of sin is going to be removed from our bodies. Every limitation in our health, everything. When you see me in heaven, friend, you're going to say, where's the guy with the glasses? I mean, that's, that's what the Lord is going to do for each one of us. The body is going to be restored. The soul is going to be restored. It's going to be brought back into a glorious condition and state. Better than Adam and Eve ever were. Better than ever they were in their lifetime. And yet this is our future. Paul is speaking here to a group of persecuted Thessalonian Christians. And he says, men and women, you're struggling now. You're finding it a hopeless situation. But I want you to see past the horizon. It's not a sunset. It's a sunrise. And if you can see that the dawning of the glory of God is coming. And there's greater things ahead of us. Salvation is our future. Damnation was our past. But now look what we have. We have hope. And I want to tell you, if you think of it like this, from the moment we stand here now till Jesus returns, that's when Jesus returns, that's salvation. That's when he comes to save the whole world from Antichrist. He comes to save the whole world from darkness and sin and the curse and the fall. And he implements the fullness of his kingdom. So we're standing here looking for that dawn, waiting for that great day to happen. But a lot of Christians ultimately believe that between standing here and Jesus returning, nothing's going to happen. Friends, the Bible says in Daniel 12 that the righteous will shine more and more until the perfect day. So not only is my future bright, my future is getting brighter as the day goes on. I am a person who's accumulating hope. I'm like an avalanche going down a hill. I'm gaining hope momentum. And the more I live the Christian life, the more hopeful I should be. Mind you, I've met, met many grey-haired people and they're not particularly hopeful. And a lot of young people are hopeful, but they're really dumb. They don't know what they're talking about. So the fact is this, that, that, you know, there is a balance. There is obviously a hope from the Lord where you know what life is like. You know what circumstances are like. But you know that things are going to get better. That's the point. So whenever the Bible says, put on a helmet of hope, it says, expect breakthrough. Expect victory. Expect a turnaround. If not now, certainly when Jesus returns. It's not a very positive attitude to take. <laughs> oh, you don't know what I'm going through. Right? Well, tell me this. Will the coming of Jesus solve that problem? Yeah, it probably will. But you think the same Jesus who's in heaven now, can he solve that problem for you? Yes, yeah, so stop being in the dump. The fact is, we, are, we have this birthright to hope. We have this expectation that God can turn it around. Well, why? You know, is it because, you know, you're just an optimistic, happy-go-lucky person? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying, reckon on God. It says in Romans 4 about, um, about Abram, it says he hoped against hope. Abram was 100 years of age. It says he was impotent. He couldn't sire a family. It says about um, his wife, she was, her womb was dead. You imagine the two of them sitting there looking at each other and says, well, you know, there's no way you're having a family. Yeah, there's no way you're having a family either. But against the naturalistic hopes, they said, do you know what we reckon? God is the God of the supernatural. God is the God who can do the exceeding abundant above all that we can ask or think or imagine. The same Abraham who went into Abimelech's household 
And all of them were infertile, every woman that was in that place. And he prayed over each and every one of them. And they had babies one after the other after the other. And there his wife hasn't a child. And it says, against hope he reckoned with hope. He says, I believe in the God of the miraculous. I believe in the God of the supernatural. Well, where is your children? You're the man he prays and all the, the sparks and the wonders and the signs and all happen. Where's it happening for you? He says, I am a man of hope. I am a man of hope. And then came the day when God spoke and says, it's going to happen. And you know what happens? They all burst out laughing. You know what hope looks like? Hope is always a joyful thing. That's why Romans 15 and 13 says, the God of all hope. So anybody here tonight feel that they're a wee bit hopeless? Their wee, their wee problem is niche. Their wee problem is so specific. Their problem is so beyond what normal people are going through. Friends, can I tell you, God is the copyright on all of the hope in all of the universe. He has hope for hospitals. He has hope for uh, bereavements. He has hope for financial problems. He has hope for the waiting list. He has hope for relationships. He has hope for every single aspect. And you are sitting in the dumps tonight in your particular situation. He says, I have all the hope. Would you like some? Well, I suppose so. If you're going to offer it, I'll see. But it says this. He's the God of all hope who fills you. With all joy and peace. I'm about to say police. He's the God who fills you with all joy and peace. In believing that you may abound in hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So that's almost like a double decker hope. Not only does God have all the hope in all the universe. Over all time and space. And he says I want to give you hope. You say well Lord it's a bit tough for me here. I'm getting it really hard. Well what, well, what, what we're going to do with you misery guts. We're going to fill you with all joy. You say, God, how could I have joy? Look at the situation I'm in. But sure, I'm beside you in it. I'm the one who turns it around. Would you like me to give you joy? Yes, Lord, I would love that joy. Would you like to taste the joy of the breakthrough here and now? Yes, I would. And so God fills you with this joy that although you're not in the breakthrough, you're living on the joy of the breakthrough before it happens. Somebody says, why are you smiling? You don't know what my future is. It says not only fills you with joy, but also with peace. When it gets quieter and you don't have the songs and you don't have the hubbub and you don't have all the noise going around you. But inside of you there's this inner contentment. There's this inner knowledge of the peace of God. God's got this. And the more you live in that joy and the more you live in that peace and that contentment. The hope rises and you say, he's got this. I don't got it, but he does. So whenever the enemy's coming against you and I. We are to be joyful, peaceful, hopeful warriors. We're not to be here in the bunker saying, oh, the devil's doing this and the devil's doing that. And I think it's a generational thing. And I think it's the devil doing this. And there's a curse and there's witches and oh boy, there's warlocks and the whole job. Friends, we rejoice in the face of our enemies. That must drive them up the walls. There's nothing that drives you up the walls than to face an enemy that's going to not budge for you. But then when an enemy comes up against you and he's singing at you, that drives you absolutely whistling at you and all. That's what we're supposed to be. Not fearful warriors. Not saying oh the devil's big and scary and big teeth on him. Friends we are those who say our God is a mighty God. A powerful God. An awesome God. And there's nothing too hard for him. And so if we have that hope in our spirit. We can look at any single problem. Any single situation and say but God. And that drives him berserk. That drives him berserk. That's why he loves this hopeless spirit that's in the church. It almost, almost to goodness, you try to get people stirred up to say, look, do you believe that God could do something? Well, I suppose if it was a Thursday and there was a reasonable weather report, and I suppose if it was a reasonable amount of money, then God could move. Friends, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. He's that powerful, that able, that strong. And he wants to give you hope. He wants to give you a new mindset. So think about it. The purpose of a helmet protects the mind, protects the vision, protects the listener. We need to have such a spirit of hope that the way we think is not pessimistic, not negative, not down in the dumps, not fearful, not worst outcome possible. But we're able to say, I factor God in this problem. I factor him in all the time. Hopelessness is where your present day suffering tells you that will always be your future. Silly illustration. You go up the wooden hill tonight Go up the stairs, you bang your toe against one of the stairs, and you say, oh boy, that hurt. A hopeless person will say, it's going to hurt forever. I hurt my toe 
in 2023 and now it's 27 day and boy it has hurt ever since. And I just look at my life and you know life is all about bumping your toe against the stair. It's really painful and everybody says it's not a real wonderful testimony how God brought you through a painful toe. That's how Christians think all the time. Friends, if you bang your thing against the toe, you're not sitting there thinking this is my future. You're saying I'm getting up the stairs. I'm going to bed, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, I'm going to get to my work. You have hope. So why would it be different if you get financial difficulties or health difficulties or, or the enemies against you or I or something's not quite working and you're frustrated with it. Friends, stop complaining about the thing. Put hope into the thing. Don't give off and say, oh, this is my destiny sealed. No, it's not. God's in charge of your destiny. He says, I have, a re- I, have a, I have plans for you that you would have reason and a hope. He says, oh, that's what I've given you. I've, I've got the plans. Just trust me. I look after it. You just, you trust my plans. I'll give you the hope. So he says, I want you to think clearly. I want you to protect your eyes. I want you to see clearly. I want you to be able also to hear clearly. You have your full senses informed by the spirit of hope. So let's look at a couple other scriptures here. Go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. This is how the spirit of hope works in our, in our warfare. Look at it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8. Verse 8 describes a hopeless man. Paul, even the man who wrote the epistles, prayed in tongues more than anybody else, raised the dead, did all the mighty works of God. But this is what he says about verse 8. In the midst of his warfare in the city of Ephesus, he says, We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, or above strength, so that we despaired even of life. There's a hopeless character right there. He's a right hopeless character. Because it says about him he's in trouble. Anybody in trouble? That's what it says about him. He says, I was in trouble. Is the devil causing him all this rake of trouble? It says we were burdened. This thing was constantly on our mind. This constantly was before us. This this thing was weighing heavily upon us. We weren't free. We weren't light and breezy. It was so heavy, so crushing, so smothering. It says we were burdened beyond measure. I couldn't, I, I just had enough of it. I had enough of this thing. I just can't get a shot of this, but it's so annoying. It's just there all the time. This problem is difficult. And it says it's beyond my strength. I feel so weak. I feel so hopeless. I feel like thrown in the towel. And it says we even despaired of life. It says, I just want to die. There's a hopeless character. Anybody identify with it? Well, what are you going to do? Just going to camp at verse 8 and say, well, you know what? It's like the man who once drove his car and he gets to the middle of the M1. He gets a you know, breaks down and he's on the lay-by and decides, well, there's no point ringing the AA, that's no point for me, I'm just going to make my home here, I'm just going to live. And he was the man who lived there for 30 years on the side of the road. A lot of Christians behave like that, literally, it's stupid behavior, but that's what they do. They all, oh, that's just happened to me and that's the way I'm going to be. No, don't camp in verse 8. Don't do that. What do you have to do? Verse 9 says, yes, we have the sentence of death on ourselves. He's realistic. He says, yes, there is a problem. Yes, there is a difficulty. Yes, it's a demonic. Yes, there is death coming against me. Yes, it's hard. But he says this is what he did. He said we should not trust in ourselves. Hope doesn't look at your resources and say oh that will solve it. No it doesn't. It says it doesn't look at yourself. But in God who raises the dead. I am weak. I am being battered and bruised. I am burdened. I am troubled. I am sick to the back teeth of having to go through this. I wish this was different. I wish I had a better life. I wish this was better. But I trust God who raises the dead. That's my confidence. I put the problem on one side of the balance. I put God on the other side of the balance. And God swings it every time. That's the hope that you and I have. He goes on to say in verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a death. And does deliver us. And whom we trust. He will still deliver us. This is a wonderful thought. In Paul's rationale. He says. I have such a sense of hope. That I'm in this crisis. God will either solve the crisis now or he will certainly solve the crisis whenever Jesus returns. It's like somebody came for prayer a few weeks back and and they said, I have this particular medical problem and people have prayed for me and I just really felt uncomfortable how they prayed and all. And they said, you know, this is a long-term ailment that I have. And what we were able to say to them is, you know, your future is healing. And they looked at me almost aghast and says, well, 
no, not with this chronic condition. I'll have this all my life. I'll have no, no, but whenever Jesus returns and you get to heaven, that's gone. Your future is healing. Your future is holiness. Your future is breakthrough. Your future is victory. You may get a little foretaste of it prior to your death. Why should then we be hopeless? We should believe in present day deliverances. And we should also believe in future deliverances as well. Let's look at another wee scripture for the future deliverances here. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15 and 24. This is our future hope. The blessed love and hope are the three, uh, the triad of, of our faith that, that holds on forever. Uh, it, it says here in verse 24, this is about Jesus and his second coming. It says, then comes the end when Jesus delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. That verse tells me that Jesus is going to bring all the demonic stuff under the rule of his kingdom and then will come the end. That encourages me so much when all the antics of Satan is being described in our world and Christians are despairing. The fact is Jesus has got this thing sorted out. And he's going to bring all of this under himself. And he's going to bring the ragtag of all the demonic stuff before his father and says it's finished, it's done, it's been dealt with. Who's to say that my particular breakthrough is just a little prerequisite to the greater one? He's going to bring an ultimate one. Why not believe for one now in space and time? We have, a, we have this eternal hope. We also have a temporal hope. We operate between the two. But our hope is in God. Let's go on to this wee idea. What, what does this all look like practically? Obviously, I've talked about how the helmet and uh, and things like that. I've talked about other items of the armor. They all have practical significance. There, there's six things I want to let you know about the, the helmet, the Roman helmet, for example. The first thing I want to say is this. The Roman helmet was strong. It was strong. It was made of cast steel or sometimes bronze. And what was lovely about the helmet, although it was made of steel, it had a little sponge on the interior or all around the, the inward of the helmet so that not only was it strong on the exterior but it fitted perfectly on the Roman soldier's head and was comfortable for him to wear. It's a wonderful thought whenever you think that Jesus is our strong hope. He's our strong hope. He is this impenetrable armor that we put upon our minds and whenever Christ is resting upon our minds what interference, what demonic thought can pierce through the strength of Jesus Christ on our mind? Whenever you have Jesus as the vision that protects you and you're, and you're seeing things, how can you not then be able to see what God wants you to see and not have any of demonic stuff trying to tell you otherwise? Whenever Jesus is the helmet protecting your ears and your listening ability, it doesn't matter what people say to you, it doesn't matter what the devil saying to you, that Christ is the strength that's holding you all together in your head. He wants to be the strength of your brains. He wants to be the strength of your scorn. He wants to be the strength in your head. He wants to cover you like a helmet. And yet what's beautiful like that we sponge. He also comforts us. It's not like Jesus just grabs us by the throat and he says wise up. <laughs> he doesn't do that to us. He speaks gently to us. He speaks graciously to us. He is so uplifting. Jesus when he was on the earth he was full of hope. Isn't that an amazing thought? You ever thought about that? That if you're Christ-like, you're a person who's always abounding in hope. They bring to him someone who has leprosy. Leprosy don't get, doesn't get healed. Jesus says, oh, no problems. They bring somebody who says, the guy's died. No problems. They, they bring someone to Jesus and says, look, this man has never walked. No problems. He was this always abundant in, in hope. Friend, I would dare say to half the Christians in our land, and if it's represented in this room tonight, you need to go and get a hope transplant. You need to get all the hopelessness. If, if we had a wee process tonight, there'll be a ministry involved where we grab you by the ankles and we'll shake all the hopeless out, out of you until your face is blue. And then what we're going to do is get hope into you. If anybody can volunteer for that ministry tonight, it would be greatly appreciated. If it would work, I would love it because I would literally have, I would set up a business. I would literally think on an industrial level it's good work. 
to get the hopelessness out of God's people and a bit of expectation of breakthrough and victory. Thanks be to God who always gives us the victory. Thanks be to God, Paul says, who always causes us to triumph in Christ. Doesn't mean it's going to happen immediately. Doesn't mean it's going to turn around as we'd like it to in our time scale. But he always will turn it around for our good. That's hope. That's hope all right. So it had to be strong. Had to be strong. Second thing. The Roman helmet also had a neck piece. Almost like a, we used to talk about men had hairstyles in the 1950s. They said it was like a, a duck's bottom. Uh, it's the idea that it was like a mullet almost. There was this little jut at the back of the helmet. And the purpose of it was as it stood out at the back. It would cover his neck. So if a, an axe or something was coming against it. It would hit the steel and not his neck. And so he would have this neck piece. It was to support and to cover the neck. Of course, what does the Bible say about Jesus? He is the Lord, the lifter up of our head. He is the Lord, the lifter up of our head. Psalm 3, 3. He's the one who says, put your neck up there. Don't get, the, don't get your neck exposed to the enemy. Don't let the enemy cut off your hopes. Don't let the enemy cut off your, your aspirations and your dreams and the things God has told you are going to happen. Don't you get that uh, cut in half. You protect the neck. You get your head lifted up there. I know I'm often told Barclays have an old habit where gravity seems to just rest in our foreheads and everybody, the head goes down all the time. We have this habit supposedly. And what we have to do by God's help is to sort of stick the neck up a bit. Where there's a wee bit of expectation, a wee bit of hope that God's going to do something better. Number three, it had ear protectors on. He had these wee ridges that would protect his ears. And the reason being he wouldn't have his ears cut off, but it also would give him the opportunity to hear his commanding officer. His words, he says, my words to you are spirit and my words to you are life. Can I say that to you? Filter the stuff you're listening to. Filter it. If you hear a report and it makes you feel down and depressed and dead inside and it just brings heaviness on you, well, don't listen to it. Shut it off. Stick your boot in the TV if you need to. Just, you know, take a sledgehammer to the radio. Whatever you need to do just to kill any voices of death. Just, I don't want to listen to it. I want to feed myself on good, spiritual, life-giving words. And if it means, if a person comes to me and says, don't even talk to me. Don't look at me. I know what you're going to say. Just keep your mouth shut. Duct tape is available. There, there are Christians, and you just know, there are two Christians in this world. There are radiators and there are drains. There are radiators who radiate heat and life, and you feel good when they're in their presence. And there's other Christians who are drains, and they take the life out of you. And you just feel you've done 50 rounds with Muhammad Ali as you listen to them. You don't want to be with those people all the time. So you have to protect your ears. The other thing about the Roman helmet was how to cheek protectors. Almost like mutton chops made of steel. And they would have these things around tight around their cheeks. To protect their uh, cheekbones. Obviously this we think about this with Jesus. Hebrews 3 and 1 says that Jesus is the high priest of our confession. I find there's an awful lot of Christians. And as soon as they're in a hopeless situation. Guess is the one thing that starts giving off stink. This old tongue of theirs. Well I'm stuck here. And this is always going to be rubbish. And this doesn't work. And I'm tired of this. And this doesn't work. And I'm getting cross. And this is always. I'm just. Oh this is the way it's going to be. And you wonder why God's not moving it. Because he says he's the high priest of your confession. If you're just saying as a pile of garbage. is never going to improve. Why would you expect him to move on your behalf? Why won't you agree with heaven. That he wants to move. It says in Hebrews 3 and 1. He is the apostle. And he is the high priest of our confession. Do you know what that means? An apostle is someone who brings breakthrough. Jesus is our breakthrough artist. But he also is our high priest who represents God. Who is bringing the prayers of earth to heaven to see it released on the earth. As an apostle he represents heaven on earth. But as high priest he represents earth in heaven. But he works on the basis of the confession. So whenever you're saying, oh, oh, this is never going to work and this is a pile of garbage. Friend, change the confession. Put this around the cheekbones and say, wait a minute. I reckon against hope that God is the God of the supernatural. A doctor can say this. My financial advisor said this. This was what I heard about it. This is what my neighbor says. This is how I feel. This is all the stuff. And you bring all the confessions under Christ and say, what does he say about it? And I agree with him. Let his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the cheek protectors all right around you. Other thing about the Roman helmet was sometimes they would have feathers on the top of it. 
not always, but sometimes it would have heather, feathers or, or, or small Lord line of uh, feathers on there. And the purpose was to identify the soldier or the regiment he belonged to. In the same way, hope identifies us as the people of God. There should be such an honor between those who are Christians and those who are not Christians. The, the people who are Christians should be abounding in optimism, saying, well, you know what? It may be bad, but thanks be to God, it's going to get better. It may be a bad day today, but thank God it's not always like this. But you find it's the other way around. It's the unsaved man or woman who's drinking and smoking and sleeping about. And, you know, and they're abounding with unending hope and optimism. Yet you speak to the Christians, you need a shovel to pick them up. They're just so down in the dumps. It's just, oh, why, why bother? And it doesn't work. And God's not doing this. And, oh, I don't know. And everybody's not right. And I'm not happy and all the rest. And with them, you don't need a shovel to scoop them up. You need a shovel just across the you know, bride, and wise them up. But Christ is the one who wants to give us his hope to identify us like a, like a feather helmet on us that we say, I stand out in a crowd. I stand out in a crowd. And there's this hope that I'm carrying. Finally, it was always tied tightly. It wasn't loose. It wasn't something that would come off easily. They held on to this helmet. So you take these six things. It had to be strong. It had to have a neck piece to protect the neck, had to protect the ears, had to protect the cheeks, had to protect, obviously, feathers as well, and it was always tightly held. Friends, you need to tightly hold on to the hope that Jesus is giving to us in spiritual warfare because this is the one thing the enemy targets time and time again where you just say, I feel like throwing in the towel, I feel like just giving up, I just feel like just, you know, white flags all around. Friends, we are more than conquerors to him that has loved us. We are overcomers. Whatever is born of God overcomes. You may not be immediate, but you will overcome. So always factor it in and says the breakthrough is going to happen. It is going to happen. So I just have to hold on tight, be patient in the meantime. God will fulfill it. God will work it out. I don't need to panic. That's what I need to do. Let's go to this uh, sword very, very quickly. Go back to Ephesians 6 and 17. So it says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema word of God. Well, let's answer this first one then. What is the purpose of a sword? Very obvious, a sword is both a defensive and an offensive object. In defense, if a man's sword was to come against you, you would counter his sword with your own. And you're acting defensively. But at the same time, you use it offensively to stab or to slash or to behead or do all the various gory things that one would do. The parallel here, according to Paul in Ephesians 6.17, is that the word of the Lord is our, is our sword. It acts like a sword. The word here for word, by the way, is not the normal word that would be for scripture. Uh, the word for scripture normally is logos or graphe. But this is the word rema or rima. It means literally an utterance or a spoken statement. That's what literally rima means. It's, it's an utterance or it is a spoken statement. And you often find in scripture this idea of, of something coming from the mouth of the Lord acting as a sword. So, for example, Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Or as Revelation 1.16 says about Jesus, out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. So that idea of, of the word of the Lord coming as a sword, that's the idea that's being shared here. But there is something quite different. The Bible is the Logos. It is the graphe. It is the... It is the final authority. It is the final word. But in that Bible, there are thousands of rimas, Thousands of rima words. There are utterances, statements, uh, things that God has communicated in little, pithy little things that speak to your heart and mind. So, for example, how many of us read our Bibles and 95% of the time it doesn't actually stand out to us or mean anything to us? I would say that's majority experience. Sometimes it's mine as well. But then there's a 5% time where you read a statement and you say, how does that ancient text speak into my circumstance perfectly and give me confidence to face the day ahead of me? That's the rhema word. It is a small utterance. It's just what you need to hear. But that small utterance serves as you and I to try to trample us and beat us back and take territory. And we take the sword and we're holding on to the defensive territory. But it's also we're using offensively to tell the enemy to back off. So, to give you a little elaboration of it. For example, in Matthew 4 verse 4, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus said, what you need more than a, a full fridge 
is to have a heart full of rhema words. That you could look back at your Christian journey and say, God spoke to me about that. God spoke to me at that time. God gave me a promise. God gave me a word. God gave me a reassurance. God gave me a prophecy. God gave me a dream. God gave me a vision. And what you find is that these are the rhema words. And they give you life. Life is the key word there, Jesus says. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every rhema word that comes from the mouth of God. Luke one thirty seven. we all know the scripture very well. With God, nothing, or the word is rhema, will be impossible. Another way to translate it is, no rhema word from God will lack power to accomplish the impossible. So in that word is power to fulfill what God has said is going to be done. Another example of it is Romans 10 and 8. We all know this. It says, what has been brought to you, it says, the rhema word of faith, even it is near you. So when you take those three scriptures together, just as a form of a definition, what is a rhema word? A rhema word is an utterance from God that gives life whenever you read it. It produces power whenever you pray it. And it gives faith whenever you believe it. That's, that's the rhema word. Whenever God has given you that, now I say it could be just reading your Bible. It could be reading scripture. It, it could be a dream. It could be a vision. It could be a word. But whenever you think about it, there's this life that comes to you. You know what I mean by that? It's like when you sit through a sermon and nothing really hits you. And then one statement hits you and just, wow, that changes your whole life. That's the rhema. That's the rhema. At the same time, it is something that whenever you take that word aside and you start to pray it and declare it, there's this power, there's this insurgency of God, there's this, this great sense of, of strength that comes to you whenever you pray it and declare it. You know what I'm talking about by that? Golly, I've got my work cut out. The fact is that you and I could go through times of prayer and it's just really heavy and you feel the devil has his hand and he's pushing you down and pushing you down and pushing you down. You start to pray that word and you start to declare that word and as Isaiah 28 talks about that the Lord is the strength to his people to turn the battle at the gate. There's a word that he gives and it's strength to reverse the enemy out of a situation. Do you know what I'm talking about now? That's good. <laughs> I was put again into worry about you. But it also is faith. That something inside of you when you start to pray this word and you start to declare this word. That you could get into the prayer class and say, oh God, we're in such a really tight situation here. I don't know how we're going to solve it. The devil has just read our book. We're just spent. We're going to just have to put up white flags all around. And yet then this thought comes into your head, but has God said this? And you start to think about what the Lord has said. And you start to pray and this faith and says, it will turn around. It will move. It will develop. It will. That's the Rima word. That's the Rima word in operation. And whenever you're using that Rima word, it is like a sword in your hand. And the devil charges at you and says, I'm going to push you out of this blessing. I'm going to push you out of the breakthrough. I'm going to push you out of this realm with God. And you take the sword and says, not on your nelly. Back off. God has said it. And he says, well, I wasn't anticipating that. Most Christians just become doormats when I come near them. And you said, I got a sword. I'm going to do something to you. <laughs> but better still, you start to be like the old, the old mighty man of David. He says he had the sword in his hand and it says he slew and he slay all around him until it says he couldn't even get the sword out of his hand. It was that seized to him. And you're slaying around you and, and I would put it to you as this. You're taking the heads of demons and you're slaying everything around you because you're declaring the destiny of God in a situation. That's effective prayer. What has God said? About the thing. What has the Lord said about a certain situation? Declare it. Speak it. Pray it. And what you find is the enemy starts to back off. Turn to one wee scripture with me. This is so important. If I could drill this into Christians. I would seriously do this. Because I'm tired of trying to try to tell them. You need to do this differently. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. This is how you use a rima word. You know for example. I mean I've seen this so many times. It just drives me up the walls. You have Christians. They get a prophetic word. They get a scripture. They get a dream. They get something from the Lord. And they say, isn't this awesome? Did you hear what the Lord said to me? Yes, we heard what the Lord said to you. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, most Christians are what they do. Well, we got a lovely word from the Lord. I got a lovely set of prophecies given to me last week there. And what I've done is I've taken this sword and I've made it a ceremonial mantelpiece. And there it is. And I get... You know, Mr. Muscle every once in a while and I spray the wee word and say, isn't that a lovely wee word? 
And they polish the wee word. And it says it's not a lovely word. Friend, the sword is not ceremonial. It's for cutting the head of every enemy that comes against you. That's what Paul says here in 1 Timothy 1.18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies or the Rima words previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. When your back's against the wall and all hell's against you and you feel like you're being crushed and you feel your head's being battered on every side, friend, take the sword out of the sheath and start flying around you. And fight your way out of the corner and says, I'm reclaiming this territory, whether it's in my brain, whether it's in my home, whether it's in my family, whether it's in my workplace, this territory's been reclaimed. Clear off! I've seen this far too many times in my own personal life. I can remember being in crisis situations before and the Lord spoke a really clear word from Romans 16. It says the God of peace will bring Satan underneath your feet. And I used to go up to an old tree in the farm and literally if anybody walked past me they thought he was half raving much like you're thinking maybe tonight. But the fact of the matter is I would go up to that old tree maybe every afternoon and I'd be praying and it says the God of peace will bring Satan underneath my feet. The God of peace will bring Satan underneath it. I'm declaring it over the situation. Praying it through. Praying it, praying it, praying it. And you know what happened? The God of peace brought Satan underneath my feet. Because what he said happened. It's as simple as that. So here you are tonight. Does anybody have, just as a, as a, as a pop survey tonight, has anybody got a word? Has anybody got a set of promises? Has anybody got prophecies or dreams or words or promises or scriptures that you know of that are life words for you? Raise a hand. Take the sword out of the sheath and start fleeing around you. <laughs> Take it and butter them every way around. Don't just treat the thing as a mantelpiece item. Take the sword and start to use the thing. Because it's God's weapon to get you out of the crisis. I find, I say that Christians and they have journals full of words and they just say, I keep these wee words and all. Friend, yes, I know sometimes they're not going to be always applicable. Sometimes God can give you a word and it's not going to be actually activated to two to three years. That can happen. But there are times when the Lord will remind you of a word and he said, I need to take that sword out of my armory and that's the sword I'm going to use to take this enemy down. Not every sword is for every battle. You need to know what sword you're using. But you'll always know it by the test. Does it produce life? Does it create faith? Does it manifest power? And you will find as you take that word and you start to use it, those three things start to happen. I can't explain it, but it works. I've been there long enough to look at it. I've been there and I've fought my battles and I've known what it's like. And some people say, I don't like the way you pray. Well, it's the only way it's got me out of my troubles. <laughs> it's the only way that's got me out. And maybe you need to pray in whatever way God teaches you to pray to get you out of your trouble. But you need to pray and you need to use the words. Let's look at these final wee things, these practicalities. Five of them. Five of them to see. First thing I want to say is that the Roman sword was short. It was short. It wasn't a long sword. It was about 60 centimeters in length. It was known as the gladius. It's where we get the word gladiator. The idea of one who carries a sword. Normally a prophetic word or normally the rhema word of the Lord will be short and punchy. It will normally be short and punchy. You'll normally find it. It will normally be a sentence. It will normally be a word. It will normally be, you know, for this place, for example, one word that God has given over many years is the word oasis. Oasis. And I cannot, if there was a word count in heaven, uh, you know, for how many times the word oasis has been used in prayer in this place for 10 years, I would say it's well in its thousands of times. But that sword has been taken from the sheath many a time when it doesn't feel like an oasis, when you feel you're in a desert and a wilderness and you contend over the word and says, God, this is what you have said. We are declaring it over the situation. You take the short, punchy word and you keep praying it, declaring it, praying it through until it happens. I think somebody said, push. Pray until something happens. I always think that something is a wee bit vague there, but at least something happened. Second thing, it was always carried in the right hand. Always carried in the right hand. Now, the Bible, as we said about it last week, I think the left hand in the Bible always speaks of relationship. The right hand always speaks of authority. So whenever you have that Rima word, that prophetic word, that promise, that thing... Don't just stand there on the left hand side. Take it into the right and start to declare it authoritatively. 
It's like if you were standing there with a big button and you're going to have all the Christmas lights put on in town. You would slam that button and you said, I have authority to hit that. And as soon as I hit that, that's what's going to happen. We're supposed to be people who activate the authority. We have the permission to speak boldly. There's a scripture, in fact, the Lord says, concerning my works, command you me. Command it to happen. He says, go for it. Go for it. Don't be all shy and timid and Northern Irish and oh, I don't know whether I can do that. And will God be cross if I do that? Well, do you know what? If you make a blunder, you'll probably make a success of it the next time. But at least try it. Third thing. His handle was made of bone and typically had good grooves. It was ergonomic, as some fancy people would say. It was tailored to the soldier's fingers that he was able to grab a hold of it. As I said before about David's mighty men in the Ezer, he grabbed hold of the sword and he fought against all the Philistines until the very sword claved to his hand. You take the word and you slay the way around you. And you hold on tight until you get the breakthrough. Fourth thing, the blade was pretty strong. It was made of two blended strips of iron and was also very sharp to the piercing of armor. One of the scriptures I love is 2 Thessalonians 2 and 8. It says whenever Jesus will come, whenever the Lord will come, it says he will destroy the Antichrist by the spirit of his mouth. When Jesus speaks, Antichrist is destroyed. When he's destroyed like that. When you speak, he's destroyed likewise. Why then should you despair for the battles you're facing? Finally, and this is quite beautiful. The Roman soldier's sword was personal. His name was typically in, engraved or uh, printed or, or, or punched into the blade. So is a Rima word. It's personal to you. I could stand here tonight and talk to you about Rima words and promises and prophecies that I'm at the moment praying through, at the moment I'm declaring, and they're not happening yet. But you would be bored to tears if I was to tell you about all the promises and prophecies because they're nothing to do with you. But they're the world to me. They're the absolute, it's my bread and butter each and every day. This is the stuff I'm having to think about. But it's personal. So you take those five things. It was short, such as the Rima word. It's normally short and pithy and punchy. It's always right-handed. has to be with authority. It has a good handle. You hold on tight, a good grip. It's a good old blade. It's good and sharp and pierces through. And then finally, it's personal. It's personal. So I want to speak to maybe folk tonight. And boys, dear, you're in a corner. And you don't know how you're going to get out of it. And you're thinking to yourself, this is so gloomy. This is so hopeless. This is so desperate. I want to tell you, put a, put a new helmet on your head. Isn't it time to maybe change your hopes? Give up the hopelessness, put on hope. Got hope. <laughs> and then what you're going to do to get out of that corner is you remind yourself of anything God has told you. You might say, I don't know, God hasn't told me anything. You just get along with God and say, God, what do you have to say about this? What have you to say about this particular thing? And when God starts to show you a thing, a scripture, a promise, a, a memory, a word or something, but it's that wee rhema word causes faith, power and life to come into you. You grab that sword and you flail all around you until anything that's off hell has to get out of your way because you are going to do mean business with them. That is the attitude of the warrior. We are hopeful, but we are dangerous. Hopeful, but dangerous. I think that would be a good name for a church, would it? <laughs> hopeful, but dangerous. Let's pray a wee minute here. So Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much tonight that the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. They are not fleshly, but they are mighty through you to the pulling down of strongholds. Lord, these are not little tools. These are not toys. These are not, Lord, little gadgets and we things to show off so that we feel, Lord, big and powerful like we're big boys or something. Lord, these are actually effective weapons that are practical and pragmatic and they work. And hell would love us to sit in mystery and to think that these things were beyond us or these things were for some capable person, but not for us. Father, we want to thank you today that we can put on this gospel armor. 
That we don't have to have any father stand in fear and intimidation. That Lord, we can have victory tonight. We can have breakthrough in this meeting. We can experience that in our personal situation. And Lord, I pray for each one of us in this place. Raise up warriors. Raise up warriors from this company of people. Because, Father, we need men and women like David's mighty men that, Lord, knew how to fight the battles, that knew how to pray. That knew. But we need people to war in the spirit. We need people, Lord, who know how to see beyond the bad news on the television and know how to get on their knees and pray. Father, we need a people that, Lord God, are, are doing, Lord, more than giving off to MLAs and MPs and counsellors. But, Lord, know how to get a hold of God. And, Lord, not give you peace night nor day until you establish righteousness on the earth. And so I pray, Lord, that you'll raise up a warrior band of your people. And uh, God, that your spirit will raise it up, Lord. And that, God, we will see so much more in this place, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <laughs> Let's raise that wee song. Um, the Lord has promised a land of good things. I will go forth and make them Father, we just give you all the glory and honour and praise tonight. The battle really does belong to you. And you fight on our behalf. And we choose to come into alignment and agreement with you as a people. That Lord, where the battles need one, where there needs to be people standing in the gap. That Lord, we stand there until we see your kingdom come. Lord, I pray that you'd put on us a Holy Spirit stubbornness. A backbone that we've never had before. You'd give us guts. You'd give us courage. You'd give us a heart. You'd give us, Father God, a brain. And that, Lord, we'll be able, Lord God, to do this good warfare, to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. So, God, we bless each and every life that's here. We pray, Lord, that you be with them and their families and that, Lord, the blessing of the Lord that's rich and adds no sorrow would be upon them all. And so, precious Father, we thank you tonight for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit to rest, abide and remain with us always. In his name we pray. Amen.